We're going to begin our service in a word of prayer. After the prayer, stay standing as you have your hymnal. And Brother Mike Goble is going to come this morning. He'll be our song leader with Shane out of town preaching, all right? So I mentioned a lot of folks to pray for. You may have someone on your heart. You may have a family member, a child, a neighbor, a co-worker, someone that God has placed on your heart you're very burdened about. It may be for salvation. It may just be spiritual need. It may be that they're going through some very challenging times. It could be an unspoken that nobody knows about. But we have an opportunity if we're saved to go before the Lord, go before the throne, take that to him and know that God hears our prayers and God is able to answer. So may you pray with me this morning. Father, we come to you here at the beginning of this service. Lord, we're thankful that you know the need of every heart. Lord, I don't. We're grateful for visitors that are here, Lord. I, I've only maybe just met them, smiled. I don't know their need, Lord. I don't know their spiritual condition. I don't know if financially things are great, health-wise. I'm sure that everyone here today could share a burden, an unspoken need, uh, someone that they're praying for for salvation. Lord, they've come today. I pray they've come today hungry and needy. Lord, we need you to speak to us, Lord. We need the word of God to meet our needs, and we know it can and will. Lord, we pray for quite a few in our church family, Lord, who are sick, lingering sickness like Lionel. Lord, those recovering from a recent surgery like Pat Moss. Those like Gina, Lord, that just uh, advanced in age and have had to go back and forth to the hospital for different reasons, Lord, and is very weak right now. Lord, we think of those that have a loss of a parent, Lord, still fresh on their heart, Lord. Sarah and Ryan, Lord, we certainly pray for them to comfort, to encourage them, to help them, family members, Lord, as well. Uh, Lord, we think of Jim Philippeck, if it's your will this week, Lord, that the doctor could get all these things in line. He could get in here, Lord, so it wouldn't be delayed for the heart catheterization. And, Lord, they wouldn't miss anything, know how to best treat that, Lord, we pray. And we pray, Lord, for Eileen Goble, Lord, as she's scheduled to go tomorrow for a knee replacement. Lord, that can be something, no doubt, that most of us would not look forward to. We might be a little nervous. And, uh, Lord, just praying and hoping that it turns out well. But, Lord, we leave her and the doctors in your hands. We pray that it could go well. We pray that it would be successful. We pray it would be a good recovery and that she would do well in those uh, weeks ahead. Lord, we're so grateful that we can come to you, Lord, not just corporately, but individually private time throughout the day, praying without ceasing to a God who hears and answers prayers. Lord, we're asking you to meet with us today, Lord. We know that you're with us. We know, Lord, that you established the church. We know that your word will be preached. So I pray you'd empower me, Lord, to preach the word straight, to preach it as you lay to my heart. Holy Spirit, apply it to each heart, each need, those watching from home, those that are here today. And Lord, I pray that we would respond in obedience. Should your spirit convict us and you move us, Lord, to make any type of decision, we'll do that out of love and obedience to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay standing as Brother Mike comes. 155. Turn to 155. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Shall his praise begin, taking away my burden, setting the spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reach as me, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea, wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me, broader than the scope of my 
my transgressions, greater far than all the sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious of Jesus, praise His name. Thank you. I was all over the place between the groups. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the lord jesus jesus how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace Just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus. Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet, a charm to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him.
more time, turn to number 368, and if you would stand, please. And uh, and and this this is a this is another one of those one of those hymns. It's a it's a prayer. All right, a tender heart. And you look at how this uh, you look at the verses, right? But look at how it ends. It says, "All my talents I surrender. I am Lord, thine, Lord. Here's my heart." I don't know what what the Lord put on Pastor's heart this morning to preach to us that the Lord has for for each one of us, but. When we're singing this, this is a prayer to God. Lord, Lord, speak to me through your word. Lord, use me how you will. Not, how, not what I want to do. You know, pastor's been preaching on talents and, and different things like that. And so we, we've all been given spiritual gifts. All right. So we've got spiritual gifts. We've got talents that the Lord has given us. Okay. Is, is, our, is our prayer really what this song is saying? Take them, Lord. You've given them to us. Now take them and use them. Use me. How would you have me to serve you? And uh, there's a lot of things that make, uh, make me uncomfortable, but that might be right where the Lord wants me. So let's, let's lay ourselves open to the Lord. Speak to me, Lord, through this message. Use me how you will, a tender heart.
invite you to take your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible today, there's a pew Bible in front of you. It should be like a dark blue. It looks almost black, but it's a dark blue. You can borrow one of those, keep it in the pew when you leave, but to turn the book of John, John 18 this morning. That's the fourth book of the New Testament, fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you're using a pew Bible, go to page 1518, 1518. That'll save you some work if you're not sure of where that book is at. 1518 in the Pew Bible, John 18 in the Bibles that you have here today. John 18. We're in a series on the Bible. It's a more of a generic title, the Bible, searching the scriptures, living the scriptures. Last week we were in 2 Peter chapter 1. The Word of God is reliable. It's sure. We have a more sure word of prophecy over experience. We can trust the Word of God. Today we'll build upon that. John chapter 18. Let's pick up the story. Verse 28. I'll not be preaching directly out of this chapter, but I will be using this to start the message, and I think you'll see where I'm going to go. John 18, of course, as you begin looking at it, this is where Jesus has been betrayed in the garden. He's been arrested. He's on trial. The cross is soon to come. But there's a reason we're going to read this. Picking it up in John 18, verse 28. John 18, verse 28. You follow along as I read. And the Bible reads, verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment. And it was early. It means it was early in the morning. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. These are the Jews. But that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, now Pilate is the Roman governor. He's the official. He's the judge. He's the one that's going to make the verdict. Pilate comes out and says to the Jews, what accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, well, if he were not a malefactor, if he were not a criminal, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your law. You take him and do, you're a Jew, I'm a Roman, you do what you want with him. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Uh Uh-oh, and he hears that. Oh, great. They're wanting him to be killed. That's why they brought him to me. Verse 32. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. So now you're going to have a shift in the conversation. Verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. So he goes back inside of the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end, these are very important words, to this end was I born. And for this cause, for this purpose, came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, <laughs> What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, not Jesus, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber and a murderer and a seditionist. No, you give us Barabbas. Now, a lot of truth in this story, but I want to focus on one phrase, and that is the question that Pilate asks. You say, well, wait a minute, he asked five. <laughs> You're right, he did. Five questions beginning in verse 33 down through the end. Five questions of Jesus, one or two more rhetorical, several Jesus answered. I want us to look today at his final and fifth question. A three-word question, what is truth. Probably said with a sneer, with a sigh, with a roll of his eyes, don't talk to me about truth. What is truth? And then, of course, he goes back to try to appease the Jews. Let me give you a quick background and context before we get into the message. My title this morning is very simple for those taking notes. It's that question, what is truth? What is truth? Christ has been arrested. I've mentioned that. He's already been on trial illegally with the Jews. That's who Caiaphas is or was in verse 28. He was the high priest. They bring him early in the morning to the judgment hall and up, up like a stage, judgment steps. They're going to take him to the governor, the judge. Pilate is his name. He's in charge of all of Judea and Jerusalem. He's been given that authority by Rome. His word will be final. The Jews have a law that they cannot put anybody to death. You've seen that. Therefore, they are required to go to the hated Romans. Pilate will have to be the one to pronounce that, not the Jews. They want him. They want him crucified. They're not happy. They didn't really have an accusation. And you see what happens. Pilate then goes back into the judgment hall where Jesus is and begins to question him. Who is this man? What has he done wrong? I'll, I'll determine if he's done anything wrong. And he asks a series of questions. Are you a king of the Jews? Am I a Jew? Why did they, what have you done? Are you a king? You keep talking about being a kingdom, and he's, he's not sure what this man is or done. He doesn't find that he does anything wrong. You can read the other gospel accounts. On many occasions, he says, I, this man has done nothing wrong. I find no fault. He is innocent. I'm going to release him. But he caves in and compromises and gives in to the pressure, the political pressure. And you know, of course, next chapter, Christ is scourged. He is crucified. He dies on that cross. And praise God that he rose again the third day. With just a few hours at the end of chapter 18, he will be at Calvary, hanging on that cross for our sins. I want to look at the question, though. Said probably rhetorically and in passing, perhaps muttered, perhaps said out loud, not intending for an answer. It comes from what Jesus said in verse 37. Jesus brings up the word truth twice. In fact, we find very much about Christ's mission. Many people confused about who Jesus is, what he was. Is he a historical figure? Is he really God? Is he really the son of God? Is he just a prophet? Was he just a teacher? Did he just do good things? Was he just a miracle worker? Jesus tells us why he came. He tells us where he's from. He says in verse 37, to this end, this is the reason I have come to earth. I'm not from here. I'm God. I'm creator. I left my heavenly abode and I came here for this purpose. And he says, for this cause, here's the very purpose. I am here and was born as a baby and I'm here today standing before you. I am to bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth hears my voice and Pilate, <laughs> what is truth? 
and walks out. That truth, don't talk to me about truth. No, that would have been common for a Roman official. If you know anything about the Roman Empire, if you know anything about the Greek culture that is still very prevalent in this time, you know that the Roman culture and the Roman Empire and the Greek culture, they didn't believe in truth. There was no absolute truth. Truth is whatever you wanted it to be. That's what all the Greek philosophers would talk about all day. That's why there were meeting places where you just go down and endlessly talk in circles about what is truth? Can you know truth? Is two plus two four? What if I think it's six? Well, it can't be. Well, it's whatever I perceive it to be. And, you know, if you walk into a room and it's you and a, and a tennis ball and it's yellow and I say, what color is that ball? And you say, it's yellow. And I say, how do you know that? You say, well, because it's yellow. How do you know what yellow is? I think it's green. And people just endlessly, does that not so happen today? It's like, oh, my word. Truth. He's, ah, what is truth? Don't talk about truth. That world in which they lived, there was no absolutes. You couldn't define anything as right or wrong. It was all relative is the word. It means it's whatever you perceive it to be, if it can even be known. Certainly don't be talking to me about truth. What is truth? Folks in those days, much like today, believe that it's impossible to know what truth really is. Truth was whatever you determined to be. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes, right? The book of Judges. That was what was happening in those days. That is what is still happening today. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. Right is whatever you think it is. And if that's what you think, then you go ahead and do it. But don't you tell anybody else what's right or wrong. Don't you judge me. You better tolerate my views. Nobody has a grasp on truth and don't act like you do. And that is the world in which the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire lived. That's why there were multiple thousands of gods, perhaps. Gross immoralities and any sin known to man being done. Many philosophies and schools of philosophy. Many suicides because the philosophy was, what is truth? Why are we here? What is our purpose? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> Who knows why we're here? Who knows what truth is? It's whatever you want it to be. Oh, well. And that's what Pilate meant in those three words. What is truth? And he walks away. You know, that question is still being asked today. Nothing's really changed, has it? Mankind still asks that question, or at least in their heart, what is truth? Can it really be known? Again, most today, are our college campuses are churning out by the millions. Students who are taught that there are no absolute truths. And for, isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? There are no absolute truths. <laughs> That's an absolute statement. All right. Uh, right? It is. Don't judge me. Aren't you not judging me then? Right? We get intimidated by that kind of... Well, you can't... Don't you judge me. Well, aren't you judging me for me judging you? There are no absolute truths. Well, that's an absolute statement. How do you know that's true? Well, I'm... What is right for you may not be right for everybody. Keep your opinions to yourself. Hey, if it works for you, great. I, if religion works for you, great. Don't you thrust it on me. Hey, it don't, you can't call things sin. It may not be sin for other people. It may not be sin in different countries. You can't say those kind of things. That's why we have judging and tolerating. and We've got to, we've got to just do, you know, get along with everybody. There is no truth. Has that not flavored then what people... You can't say marriage is defined by the Bible. Marriage is whatever you want it to be. Don't you thrust your opinion down on me. Gender, you can't, you can't, no, 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 no. And we could go on and on, I need not name every little thing. You can't say that's sin. How do I know, how do you know that's sin? Maybe sin for you, may not be sin for me. May not be sin for somebody else. You don't know, you're not in there, you don't know what's happening. Hey, stealing, you can't say that's wrong. What if they had a need to steal? Hey, we, I mean, no, and we live in a world today which is no different than it's ever been, nothing new under the sun. What is truth? <laughs> Nobody knows can I say that young people are calling out that question, what is truth? Can I say that college students are calling out that question, what is truth? Can I say that parents are calling out that question, professionals? Can I say that politicians? Can I say that the poor, the rich, the atheists, the religious are asking that question? What is truth? Can it even be known? Is it even possible? Or do we just go through life drifting aimlessly, every man doing that which was right in his own eyes? I want to answer that question with an absolute. 
Yes, you can know the truth. Yes, there are absolute truths. Yes, the Bible is the source of all truth. Those are absolutes. God works in absolutes. Do you, have you read your Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is an absolute statement. I mean, that's how the Bible starts. Boom. Now, you can say as a sinner, well, I don't know if I agree with that. doesn't really matter. In the beginning, God created. Wow. I, the Bible is full of absolutes. There are absolute truths. The Bible is that. So the answer to, is there a truth? Can you know it? Is it possible? I'm answering today, absolutely. The answer is yes. In fact, we can find the answer just one page over, maybe. Go to John 17. John 17. Again, we're studying in Sunday school the Bible, searching the scriptures, how to study the Bible, how to interpret the Bible. We said the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. You, need not, uh, you do not always need to go outside the Bible to find the answers. Just one chapter previously, Jesus gave the answer. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Boy, that ought to be underlined in your Bible right there. Thy word is truth. There's the answer, Pilate. What is truth? The word of God. That is truth. Wow. Psalm 119, 142, thy law is the truth. Psalm 119, 151, all thy commandments are truth. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. In fact, I'd like you to turn there. Would you keep your, you can put a bookmark or your notes right there. Go back to the Old Testament, book of Psalms. Book of Psalms should be too hard to find. Uh, it's usually around the middle of your Bible, maybe a little bit to the left of the middle. Go to Psalm 19, Psalm 19. If you're using a pew Bible, I probably should have had this marked because that can be challenging to find. You maybe beat me to it, page 836, all right? In a pew Bible, page 836 if you're using that. Psalm 19. The Bible claims to be the source of truth. We're going to see that. I believe it. That's what we're studying the scriptures for. Yes, there are absolutes. Yes, God has not left us to drift aimlessly. No, we're not to be guided by our own, what every man thinks is right or wrong. No, what culture does not determine what's right or wrong. No, our country we live in does not necessarily determine that. The Bible determines that. God determines that. God has given us a source of truth. It is for us today. Notice what it says about the Bible, Psalm 19. You're in 19, not 119. Psalm 19, look at verses 7 through 11. Many of you know this, this song, this chorus you sing oftentimes when you're in youth group or when you're with children. The law of the Lord, all of these are referring to the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Wow, that's powerful. Six phrases there describing the word of God. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, the word of God, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, God's laws, there is great reward. Wow. That means God has fixed laws and commandments that are absolutes. Moreover, by opening the word of God and reading them, we are warned, thou shalt not, do not do this. This is sin, this will ruin your life. This is an affront to Almighty God. I'm warned by that, I can choose to obey it or not. And by keeping them, great reward. Wow, the word of God. Last week, again, I preached on 2 Peter chapter 1. We went through the entire chapter. Peter was telling us his personal experience of being on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John and seeing Jesus Christ transfigured, literally transformed into his deity in his Godhead and seeing Elijah and Moses up there and they fell down and worshiped. And he says, man, I, I was there. I saw it. I experienced it. I was an eyewitness and I live. And by the way, that was a valid experience. Not, I'm not saying all experiences are wrong, but he said, I don't put my trust in that. That. Uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy today that is the word of God. More reliable, more trustworthy in my own personal experience is the scriptures that were given by God. God breathed those out, inspiration. Holy men of God spake as they were moved. What am I saying today? I'm saying this. The Bible is the very word of God. Every word breathed out by God. That's called inspiration. It is authoritative. 
It is trustworthy. It is reliable. It is without error. And it is absolute truth. Now, I want to say this. Some, for all people, all cultures, all languages, and all nations. Now, there is no other book that makes that claim. Wow. God has given his word. Well, that's just for Americans, huh? Well, you know, all cultures are different. You go different places. Have you never read mission work? Do you not know the history of missions? When they go to countries that are cannibals. We, folks, if you don't know the history of missions, there were people who surrendered to God to be missionaries, who got off the boat, walking to the shore of islands with cannibals, who were eaten alive before they even shared the gospel. And yet they loved the word of God and were willing to do that. And you know what? More missionaries came after them. And you know what? Many of those cannibals and lifestyles were changed to the gospel. You say, well, that's just their culture over there. You, you, know, you can't force the word of God. It's their culture. We're not talking about making people Americanized. We're talking about the word of God is for them. And you know what? That is sinful and that is wrong. And that is, God, here's what God has. Nations, you go into some of these tribes, they weren't wearing any clothes. They were murdering multiple wives, spirits and cuttings. You say, this is what the word of God says for you. It's for all people at all times and all cultures and all nations and all languages. You say, well, how is that possible? Because the source is God. It is not possible any other way. The only way that that could be true is if the source of the Bible is from a greater power, and that is Almighty God, the Word, that gave us everything in the Bible. Therefore, it's going to be a reflection of God. God is trustworthy. God is without error. God is without contradiction. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. There is no culture, nation, people, group that God says, whoops, I didn't know that. I didn't know they'd be that way. I didn't know that they would be dealing with that. I'm going to have to revise the Bible. God knows all things. God created all things. And God has given us a reliable source of truth, the Bible, that is for all people at all times. Deuteronomy 32.4 states, God is truth. John 14.6, you can go back to John if you have that marked. Deuteronomy 32.4, if you're taking notes, says God is truth. You would say, okay, I agree with that. John 14.6, Jesus makes a very authoritative, absolute statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Wow, now that's absolute, folks. And what did Jesus say? I'm the truth. John 17, 17, he said, thy word is truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says that God is truth. Jesus just said in John 14, 6, I am truth. And later in that chapter, look at John 14, verse 17. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, even the spirit of truth. Now, wait a minute. God the Father is truth. Jesus the Son is truth. And the Holy Spirit is truth. And 1 John 5, 7 says all three are one, the Trinity. Exactly. Therefore, you can't separate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. They're all the same. They're the same source. They're the same being. They're one God, triune God. Therefore, if God has a flaw, the Bible has a flaw. Therefore, if God has an error, so all of them, God is truth. Christ is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. Wow. Therefore, His Word must be truth. God is without sin and error. Therefore, His Word is without sin or error. I'm here today to say we have one complete absolute source of truth, and it's for all people. Now, I want us to finish up here by, I've got, those weren't necessary, but I'm going to give you nine quick things in a row here that all begin with the word one. Zero N-E, or you can just put a one, all right? I want to show you how the Bible fits together. God's word is unified. God's word declares these truths, these truths are found throughout the entire Bible. Now, you would think, that with a book this big, which is made up of 66 individual books, surely all 66 are not going to agree completely. There's going to be some... And, and by the way, it's not like it's just one person, humanly. Now, there is one, one author. So obviously, if one author writes it, you would think it would be... Yeah, but, yeah, but there's over 40 different men that wrote this. Human penmen that God worked in. I mean... 
And they didn't all live at the same time. They weren't all like in the same room right here today. And I say, all right, everybody, stop what you're doing. Take out notes and reproduce my message right now. Now, some of you would struggle with that. You, you're, you're here, but you're not here. Go ahead, right now. Write, write down everything I just said, whatever you can remember. I'll give you five minutes. Sometimes I do that. I used to do that in Bible class. All right, boom, right. <laughs> Pass them in. I'm going to collect them. <laughs> Find out who's listening, who's drawing, who's way off, who's not even. Oh, now, even with everybody in the same room hearing the same thing, we're going to have disagreements in here. We're going to have to say, wait a minute, you said it. I didn't say that. Oh, I thought I heard you say that. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 much less 40 different men who lived in completely different time periods, separated by over 1,500 years. Whoa. And, and, they, and they wrote it, they didn't, I mean, they weren't all from the same background, like professional men, lawyers. I mean, some of them were kings, and some were princes, and some were shepherds, some were farmers, some were fishermen. Uh, and yet, and, and they wrote these, and, and then it's all compiled here into the Word of God, and we have the complete Bible made of 66 books by over 40 different authors over a 1,500-year period. And yet, when you read the Scriptures, it's all unified. It's all, why? Because this one source, God above. It's the word of God. And by the way, it's still here. <laughs> no book more attacked, more mocked, more ridiculed, more laughed at, more dissected than the word of God. And it's still here. And it always will be here. And it will be in heaven because you can't separate it. God is the word of God, the living word. It's true. It's for all people here. So here we go. I'm going to show you how we can have one complete absolute source of truth. I'm going to go pretty quick here. All these statements I believe with all my heart. I believe it's the true message of the Bible. Number one, there's one God who created all things. And by the way, all my little notes, these are all absolute statements. Found in the absolute word of God that are for every person who's ever lived. Past, present, and future. These are universal statements. There is one God who created all things. One God. One God. There's no more than one. I'm going to read some scriptures. Probably go faster than maybe you could turn. I'll give you the references. Nehemiah 9.6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all things that are therein, and seas, and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship thee. You know what? You're going to go through your Bible, and you're going to find out, despite being separated by thousands of years, the Bible agrees completely. There is one God. And that one God has created everything that exists, and he spoke it into existence by his own power. 624 literal hour days. One God created it all. I'll read from uh, Isaiah 45, probably the greatest chapter in the Old Testament on God, who he is. Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord and there is none else. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Whoa. Verse 18, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Whoa, absolutely. You're in the book of John, I want you to turn to Acts 17, just a little bit to your right. Acts 17, also one of the most Powerful, important chapters in the New Testament. Acts 17. Go to Acts 17. If you're in John, you just go 10, 15 pages to your right. You go to the book of Acts. Go to Acts 17. The Bible declares there is one God who created all things. By the way, that answers why there can only be one source of truth. If there were 20 gods, by the way, could 20, all, could 20 gods all be all powerful? <laughs> that, that contradicts each other. Well, this God's the most powerful. We've got little sub-gods. No, they're all, it, it's impossible. All right? Uh, then there would be contrasting truths. All right? There is one God. Therefore, that one God has absolute truths, and it's found in his word. And he said he has created all things. Look at Acts 17, verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24. Very important verse for your Bible. Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples 
made with hands. All through the Bible, we could go all through it, it's going to declare the same truth. One God, Jehovah God, he made and created everything, all things, by speaking in existence. Wow, one God that created all things. Number two, my second point. One human race of one blood. Same chapter. One human race of one blood. Look at Acts 17, verse 26. Acts 7, you're in the, right there looking at it. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. For to dwell on all the face of the earth. By the way, it doesn't say on the face of Mars, Jupiter, or unexplained planets that we're spending billions of dollars looking for life. Suppose just believe the Bible. All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed. You know what Satan, the world, wants to always do? Put us all in groups and divisions. Break down by ethnic groups and cultures and skin color. You know what the Bible says? It never does that. One blood. All, all, by the way, all, all, we're all the same skin color. It's just different shades. It really is. Put us in the groups. You got the Jews over here, and we got the Muslims over here, and we got the Hindus. And uh, Are you saying that God... Let's go to the Bible. One God, one blood, we're all the same. That's what the Bible says. One God, he created everything. He created one human race, we're all the same blood. Absolutely. You know what Malachi 2.10 says? Probably not. All right. It says, have we not all one father? Hath not God created us? <laughs> have we not all one father? Hath not God created us? Absolutely. We have all are from the same genetic pool. We can, every single person on the face of the earth will trace their genetics down to Adam. Adam and Eve. Absolutely. One blood, one race, by one creator. Point number three. We have one, all have one universal problem. This builds upon one another. There's one God who created everything. There's one human race of one blood, and God created them. And therefore, the entire human race has the same universal problem. It's called sin. It's called sin. For all have sin. The Bible makes absolute truths, and it goes to the entire Bible. All have sin and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We have all together gone astray and left God. We have all forsaken the right way. Wow. One universal problem to every nation, every blood, every creed, every person, doesn't matter what. It's universal, the Bible says. It's sin. Number four, one universal penalty. So you can't have universal statements that apply to everybody unless you have an absolute truth. But if there's an absolute truth by an absolute God, then these apply to every single person, no matter where you go. You can share the gospel in China, the same as you would share it down in Chile, the same as you would go to an island in the South Pacific, the same as you would go up to Upper Canada, and it's the same gospel for the same people who need the same message by the same God. We have the same universal penalty, and that is death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Old Testament, the soul that sinneth, it must die. Romans 5, 12, Wherefore by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Those are universal statements, and those are universal statements. Those are true only because there's one God who created everything. One human race, that are all the same blood. One universal problem, sin, that is passed from Adam to every single person born of Adam. Except one, which we'll get to. One universal penalty, which is death. That's eternal separation and judgment, separated from God for all of eternity. Wow, number five, one universal solution. Aren't you glad it doesn't stop right there? That one God who created everything. That one God who made all nations and all people groups from one blood. That one God who did not desire sin to come, but man in his own free will chose to rebel and plunge the world and all of us into sin. That's it. We inherit that. God had one universal solution. You know what it's called? It's called Calvary. Now, I want to be careful. I'm not just saying the cross. There were thousands of people who died on crosses. I'm not demeaning the cross. The crucifixion was practiced by the Romans and many others. There were many. There were two others that died on the cross with Jesus. So it wasn't just the cross itself. I think you understand what I mean. The solution was Calvary. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us, notice, in that while we were yet sinners, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's the solution right there. God, who is rich in mercy, 
For God so loved the world, not willing that man should perish and just be lost in sin. He gave us a universal solution. That is for all people at all times. In any place you go, in any language, Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again on the cross. Wow. That's an absolute, folks. Some people don't like that, the Bible says. For some, that's a stumbling block. For some, it's a laughter, it's a mockery. They can't believe that. The cross, salvation through Jesus Christ. Number six, there's one Savior. Not only is there one solution, Calvary, there's only one Savior. Only one Savior. I want to say this, it's not you. To think, now we know that it has its origins through Satan, who in the very beginning, chapter 3, what was his number one attack? He questioned the word of God. Right? It's always been Satan's attack. God's word is true. He said, really, hath God said that you should not eat of that tree? He's never stopped that. Caused doubt. The word of God's not true. Trust in your own instincts. Come on, come on, Eve. Believe what you think. Come on, that's not true. You, uh, absolutely. So we know that the spiritual deception has been Satan's number one thing today through religion. A lot of people religious. A lot of different ways to get to heaven. A lot of different truths out there, right? You say, well, this church says this, and this denomination says this, and this cult says this, and this man says this. They're all different. One absolute sort of truth right here. There's only one remedy for sin. There's only one Savior, and that Savior is not you. you you're not going to be able to do it. Nowhere does it say that anywhere in the Bible. In fact, the Bible gives the opposite, doesn't it? Ephesians 2, 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, what is it here, 5? Not by works of righteousness which we have wrought. All right? Romans 5, therefore shall no flesh be justified in God's sight by the deeds of the law. I mean, do you believe the Bible or not? It's a source of truth. God said right now, no possible way for you to redeem yourself from your sin and to get to heaven on your own. It can't be done. We're all in the same universal problem. We all are facing death and hell. Christ, though, is the answer. He is the Savior. We looked at that at Christmas time, right? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he, he shall save his people from their sins. It would make sense, right? One universal problem, one universal solution. There can only be one Savior then. In fact, can you go anywhere in the Bible where God just lets you multiple ways to do it? It's up to you. Go ahead and do it lots of ways. No, no, no. no. The theme is throughout the scriptures. God is a God of unity. God is a God of one. One God who created all things. One human race of one blood. One universal problem, sin. One universal penalty, death. One universal solution, Calvary. One Savior, Jesus Christ. Number seven, as we wrap it up here soon. One way to heaven. How could there be any other way? There's only one God. There's only one source of truth. There's only one, so therefore that makes perfect sense. The Bible says it, and I understand it. There can therefore only be one way to heaven. Now, if there were 10 gods, I guess there could be 10, 10 ways to heaven. I guess if there were 500 gods, I guess there could be many ways. I guess if there was no God, we wouldn't even care. But there is a God. And he's all-powerful. And he's created everything. And he created me. And all mankind is plunged into the same problem. And we don't even have to watch the news to look at that. And nobody has a solution or an answer. A lot of people are trying a lot of different things to get to heaven and get to God and find purpose. And a lot of different answers out there for it. But, but the Bible speaks authoritatively that there's only one way. And it's only through Jesus Christ. And the only way to heaven is through him. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am, the, I am the only way, is what he's saying. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. There is no other way. No man can come to... I mean, can you make it any straighter than that? Can I shoot any straighter? Can we cut it any straighter? No man cometh to the Father but by me. But by me. No works attached. Never in the scriptures will you see anything. You, sorry if you're holding on to baptism. That's after salvation. Sorry if you're holding on to Mass. Sorry if you're holding on to christening. Sorry if you're holding on to praying. Sorry if you every day ask Jesus to save you. That is not biblical salvation. You do not believe if you have to pray every day to be saved. Every day, you do not believe that his work on the cross was sufficient and finished. You are weak in faith. 
It can't be done. Once he died on the cross, once he rose again, once he offers eternal salvation through him, and it's eternal life, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. If there was another way, we would have been told in the scriptures what it is. Did not Jesus pray that in the garden? Basically, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. If, basically, if there's any other way, he's not sh shirking his response. If there be any other way to redeem all of mankind without the cross, then let it be done. And God was silent because there was no other way. And Christ accepted that and said, let's go to the cross. This is it. There is no other way. I, being the only perfect man who was never sinned, born of a virgin, not of a man, therefore not inheriting the sin nature through Adam, lived a sinless, perfect life, but still would have to voluntarily, not be forced on the cross, but do it in love as a perfect substitute. And Christ was willing. He took our pain and he took our punishment. And he took the entire wrath of God he took the death that you and I deserved. Jesus Christ, God himself, who had never, ever even seen or touched or looked at sin, said, became sin for us. God poured out his wrath in those hours of darkness on his son, that lamb. And Christ bore it for us. There was no other way. He died. He said, it is finished. This is it. This is the only way. And it's complete. And I have finished it. And he died. Wow. He died. And he was buried. And he was there for three days dead. And three days later, he rose again. In his own power, it said, never to die again. And because he lives eternally, he is the only one that can say, I am the only way. Can you name anybody else that died for your sins? Can you name anybody else that rose for your sins? Can you name anyone else that satisfied God's wrath and did it on his own behalf? Can you name him? No. Therefore, there can only be one way. It's through him. And he offers it to anybody. No man can come to the Father but by me. And he says it's free, by the way. That brings us to number eight. There's one way to heaven. Number eight, there's only one desire and will of God. One desire and will of God. And this is for every person that's ever lived, past, present, future. For God so loved the world, all of humanity, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever means exactly what you think it means, anybody, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, rescued, delivered. That's God's one great will and desire. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. That is the will of God, that all men would be saved, all mankind would be saved. And notice, and to come into the knowledge of the... Who will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. This is true. I am wrong. I am going to acknowledge that, bow the knee, repent of my sins, and accept the free gift through Jesus Christ. I'm acknowledging the truth. The truth. Thy word is truth. Exactly. One desire and will of God, not willing that any should perish. That means exactly what it is. Any. Not one person. Salvation is for all people. It's there. We sang it when we were saying wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaching to all the lost. Even the most undefiled. It's available. It's there. And that brings us to our final point as we're done. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. And we looked at this at our Valentine's banquet. But this is where it sort of stops. It's a gift. It has to be received. You do not inherit it. It's not passed on through family genes. Your parents could be strong Christians. You don't automatically become a Christian. It doesn't come from going to church. It doesn't come from trying to be a good moral person. Nope. It's a gift. It was accomplished on the cross. 
It's available to anybody and everyone. It is the will of God that you receive that gift. But you have to accept it and receive it. And that brings us to the final point. There is one decision. But I can't tell you what that decision is for you. I know what God wants you. I know what I desire. That decision, though, is your decision. You have to make it. Moms and dads, you can't make it for your children. You wish you could. I know it. Can't make it for your grandchildren. I know you do about anything you could. If you could just, they, they have to choose. Can't do it for a spouse, brother, sister, friend. They, you can present the gospel. You can share it. And I hope you do. You can give it simply. You can give it lovingly but authoritatively. It's up to them. God created us that way. We don't have to accept it. We don't have to believe it. We do not have to acknowledge the truth. The Bible says there are those that resist the truth. There are those who do not believe the truth. There are those who mock the truth. A lot of different reactions to the truth when it's presented. That's your decision. So I want to ask you as we wrap it up this morning, will you believe God's word, the truth? Will you receive the gift today, right now, today, right now? Not later today. I presented to you what I believe is the gospel in a nutshell. I presented to you what I believe is the entire picture of the entire Bible on all pages over thousands of years in one unified message. I believe that everything I said is biblical. You don't have to believe that, but it's throughout the entire scriptures. I laid out the gospel. It's available. It's sitting right there. The Holy Spirit of God, I hope, has illuminated your heart. For those that may not know Christ, or you haven't decided. For those who have, I hope that your heart's been warmed and encouraged as you remember when it was you received the free gift of salvation. I hope you never forget it. I hope you're still in all of it. I hope you never lose the wonder of it all. And I hope you can't wait to share it with other people who do not know. Understanding, we can't save anybody. But God has called us to share the gospel and to make sure that that good news goes throughout the entire world, but it's up to them to receive it. But we're going to do everything we can impact them for the cause of Christ and to start that Christian life and to live for him and to see all that God has us. But you have to answer that question. Will you receive it? I don't know. Some of you right now at the moment of decision, we're gonna, about to have an invitation. Uh-oh, everybody thinks I'm saved. You want to please the Lord? I know, but, uh, but uh, what are people going to say? What is God going to say? The Bible says, whosoever believes on him is not ashamed. I know, but uh, I'm not ready yet. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now. There's no guarantee you'll be here tomorrow. There's no guarantee you'll be here tonight. There's no guarantee you'll make it through lunch. Now's the time. Now, today, today, today. For no one knows when their life will end. I want to ask you, I want to ask all our teenagers over here. Are you 100% sure you're going to go to heaven if you die? Not because mom and dad tell you. And you, every time everybody asks you, well, mom and dad said I'm saved. No, it's got to be, you've got to know you're saved. No, not, how about some of you adults? Well, I, I prayed this prayer. What are you trusting in, the prayer or the word of God? Well, I, I, I don't know. Are you saved? Do you understand the gospel? The answer to the question, what is truth, is very simple, I believe. Truth is the word of God. The question today is, what will you do with the truth that was just presented to you? The gift is free. It's gift wrapped. Your name is on it. You have to receive it. You have to acknowledge the truth of the Bible. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I believe that there's a God that may. Yes, I believe that I can't get there on my own. I've got to stop. Yes, I believe that God's holy and I'm unholy and I confess that I sins and I repent and turn from them and I turn to Jesus Christ who's the only way and I acknowledge that and I receive and accept that gift right now, today in faith. And when that's done, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, I give you eternal, everlasting life that shall never end. And who's that based on? Not the preacher. That's based on Jesus Christ, God himself, who's truth, who cannot lie. So if he says, I'm giving you eternal life, it doesn't matter what you feel like today or what you feel like tomorrow or how miserable you think you are or God's not around. If you did what he said, you're saved. You're eternally saved. It's in his hands. 
And we ought to live in confidence and boldness and eagerness until he comes, serving him and loving him and sharing the gospel and realizing we do have purpose. There is truth. God's word is what I can bank on and stand. It's an anchor in a time where culture shifts constantly. I can't worry about what everybody's doing, what TV says in Hollywood. I've got to trust the word of God. I've got to know the word of God. And I have a sure word that I can trust and stand on. Praise God, that's the word of God. I want to ask you, what are you going to do with it? Have your ears tickled, your heart burned a little bit, endure the invitation, and head on your way. Now's the moment of decision. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We'll wrap it up here. I appreciate great attention. I know it's a little warm. Now's not the time to slip out and get uncomfortable. Now's not the time if you're dealing with the Lord and say, uh-oh, I got to, uh, nope, now's the time to deal with the Lord. It's not to worry about your brother, your sister, your wife beside you, your cousin, your nephew, you and God. I have a question for you today. Answer in the quietness of your heart. Are you 100% sure that if something tragic happened today, your sins are forgiven, that you'd be in heaven with the Lord because you have acknowledged the truth of the Bible? Are you 100% confident? That confidence is based not on your feelings, not on emotions, not on what other people have said, but what you have done according to what God has said. There is truth. God's truth is revealed in the Bible. He's given it to us. It's for every people group. Jesus Christ came and loved us and died for us as a sinless son of God. It was sufficient for every single person. It's available to every single person. And God desires that you would be saved. Have you received that free gift? Have you received forgiveness of sins? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If not, today is the day that you can do that and look back on and say, Praise God. Today, February 19th, 2023, I became a child of God. I was put in the family of God forever. And I've never had to doubt that again. If you're here today, can I ask you a simple question? Maybe you'd say, Preacher... I don't have that assurance. I struggle with it. Oh, I struggle with it. I'm not sure. I just, oh, I, but I'm here today and pet preacher, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. I believe what you preach. I see what the word of God says. I don't know that I've ever done that or I've done that, but I've been putting other things that are added by man. I need to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and be born again and saved today. And I'd like to do that. If that's you with no one looking, would you slip your hand up? I need to be born again today. Absolutely. I need to be saved. I, in fact, maybe you say, I'm not even ashamed of my watches. I need to be saved, and I, that's between me and the Lord. I'm ready to be saved. I am eager to be saved. I'm afraid to not be saved. For man knows not what's on the morrow. I would like to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. All right, if you're here today and you say, boy, I was trembling. I wanted to raise my hand, but, oh, I just couldn't do it. I, I, must, I just couldn't do it. I'm not used to invitations. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ right here on your own. You can acknowledge the truth as you sit there with your head bowed. You can just in a quiet voice where no one hears but God say, God, I believe what the preacher said today. I believe every word he preached because I think he preached from the Bible, God. He read verses and quoted the scripture. I believe it. I believe that you're one God who made all things. I believe there's only one human race and we're all the same blood. I believe we've all sinned against you. I believe we're in a mess down here. I believe we deserve death and punishment, God. We deserve it. I believe that Christ, who's God, came and died for our sins. I believe that he paid for it on the cross. I believe it's available to all people. God, I believe that. I believe that Jesus can forgive me my sins and make me a brand new person. And right now in my pew... Quietly, I'm asking you to save me. I'm confessing my sins and say, oh God, I am a sinner and I don't deserve it, but please save me. I'm calling upon you right now as I sit here today in this sanctuary. Lord, please save me. Please make me a brand new person. I want to be saved and know you personally and be in God's family. You know, if you believe that with all your heart, and you do, but God said, the Bible says you called upon him, you acknowledge the truth. That's biblical salvation. Would you let us know when you leave today and shake my hand, my wife, and say, I want you to know, preacher, I prayed that. I trusted Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. Perhaps you're here today and you could say, and praise God if everybody here today, everyone watching from home is saved. That'd be awesome. Praise God. We ought to be on fire for God. What, what, what we could do in this community, what we could do in our neighborhoods, 
Over 100 people in this auditorium, I would say today, probably, not counting our children and teens. Wow, 100 people that know Jesus Christ, who are not ashamed of the gospel, who believe the Bible, who understand there's one source of truth, who understand that this world's in a mess of trouble, but we've got the answer and the good news. And if everybody here today goes out and shares that good news, and that looks for opportunities to talk to neighbors and co-workers, and shares the gospel, and writes the letters, and prays, and gets busy serving God, and comes back tonight, whoa, what God could do here. Not just maybe at some college campus in Kentucky. Maybe not just some other place that we're skeptical about and say, God can do it right here. Start today, oh God. Start right here in IBC Durier. God, I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I'm ashamed of the gospel. But I want to share the good news. Hey, maybe you've been intimidated. You say, I don't know how to answer everybody's questions. You just take the outline I just gave you. It's probably not mine to start with. I'm sure other people came up with it. And say, I'll just share the gospel using the ones. One God, one human race, one problem. I'll just share. That's all you need to do. God will do the rest. Do it in love. Do it with passion. Do it with the Lord. God will take care of all that through his Holy Spirit. How many of you here today say, preacher, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, but I've been neglecting the source of truth, the word of God. Oh, I believe it's the word of God. I, I, I do. I don't believe in other ways, but I just, I, in practical Christian living, I believe it, but I don't. I believe it, but I don't believe it. It's, I don't practice it with my children. I believe, I believe it's absolute truth, but I, just, I don't, we do it our way, not God's way. Well, with our finances, we, uh, we don't really, I mean, we don't really do it. We just, we just do it, you know, read a book once. I don't really do it God's way with our money. Well, you know, when it comes to what we watch, what we, I, I mean, we just sort of do it how we think's right. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. The word of God is not just truth for salvation. It's truth for all points of living, for b biblical sanctification, for godly Christian living. Do we believe it? Do we believe it's truth or just when it comes to salvation? Do we pick and choose what parts we're going to believe and follow and say, God, thank you. I know you're there, but I think I'll do it my way when it comes to friends, my work, my relationships, my speech. I, I think I've got it cornered. No, God's word is truth. Maybe today you'd say, preacher, I'm saved. But God's spirit really smoked my heart about believing and living the entire Bible. Getting into it, maybe, maybe I got to start getting into it and see what does it say about this. I'm a little bit weak in this area, but I want to get in the scriptures. I want this to be my sole source of truth. God, use this message in my heart. Just slip your hand up right back and down. Don't have to hold up long. Boom, right up, right back down. Praise the Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you accomplished today. As our pianist begins to play, just a quick, quiet, if you would, invitation. Don't want to leave without God perhaps working in your hearts and you making a decision. What would God have you do today? If you're not sure you're saved, would you slip out right now while heads are bowed? Or if you prayed that prayer, maybe you just slip to the front and shake my hand. You can go right back to your seat. Say, Pastor, I want you to know I prayed that. I received Jesus Christ. Praise God. Maybe you're burdened over someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ. You say, oh, God, I've been, I haven't shared the gospel. I've been a little bit ashamed. I've had excuses. But if I believe this is truth and it's what they need, God, I've got to share it. Even if my heart's beating, even my tongue is dry. Oh, God, help me to share it. I'm going to do it, God. Don't make a commitment you're not going to keep. Maybe it's time dad's headed home. We haven't had the family altar. We haven't been teaching my children what God's word says about truth. They've got questions about marriage and gender and, and sexual things that they hear all the time and their friends in schools. They don't know what's right or wrong, what the Bible says about what to watch and what not to watch and why we do this and don't do this, why the church is important, why holy living. Well, God loves me. The word of God is here for us. I've got to start teaching them that. I've got to start living it. They've got to see it from mom and dad every day. Oh, God, help me. The altar is open. Maybe you want to kneel by the pew. Make a commitment to God. God, I need to get back in the word of God. I can't just play at it, read a little devotional, and that's it. If I believe the word of God is absolute truth, then, God, I'm going to get in it, and I'm going to live it, and I'm going to believe you. I'm going to practice in every area, for I believe it's true. Father, take the word of God that was preached today. Lord, it was not of me, but it was of you. May your spirit take it, apply it to those that need it in whatever area it may be. For your word is true, it's righteous, it's clean, it's pure, and will never lead us astray. So grateful, Lord, you have given us your word. You did not just inspire and breathe it, but Lord, you've preserved it for us today. And Lord, it's your desire that the gospel go out to every corner of the globe so that every ear may hear the good news that Jesus Christ saves. 
Lord, I pray you'll bring us back tonight with eagerness and excitement to fellowship, to sing, to grow in Christ, to serve, to use our gifts, Lord, to build this body as believers as you would have. Lord, give us a great afternoon, I pray. Lord, if there's folks struggling, may they just spend some time in prayer. Open the word of God. Seek some godly counsel. Lord, help us to love one another as you've loved us. We praise your name for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to...